Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Apologies have been received from Oliver Mundell, and we're therefore delighted to have Alison Harris with us this morning as a substitute for today's meeting. And Tavish Scott will be joining us a little later this morning. First item of business is the second evidence session on the committee's subject choices inquiry. And can I welcome to the meeting this morning Dr. Alan Britton, Senior Lecturer in Education, University of Glasgow. William Hardy, Policy Advice Manager, Royal Society of Edinburgh, and Professor Jim Scott, School of Education and Social Work, University of Dundee. Uh, can I say to the panel at the outset, if they would like to respond to a question, please indicate to myself and the clerks, and we'll try to get you um, in as often as possible. I'm go we're going to move straight to questions this morning, and I'd like to invite first Liz Smith. Thank you, convener. Um, just before Easter, we obviously had the uh, first session, and that involved uh, Education Scotland, who seemed to be implying in the response that they gave, I think, to my colleague uh, Ian Gray, that the, the, the reduction in subject choice was actually intentional uh, on the basis that the uh, traditional uh, curriculum was no longer working for too many youngsters, and that we wanted to move away from the breadth and learning to greater depth and learning and also extend the number of courses that deal with other skills. Is that the same interpretation from the research that you've all carried out? Is that the same interpretation that you would give that it was an intentional reduction or do you think it was? Uh, not, not at all. I think it's um, been quite clear in the research and work that's been carried out that um, the reduction in course choices at S4 particularly as a result of an uh, unintended consequence, um, particularly around the national qualifications comprising 160 hours. Um, the time within a single year, you can fit in that learning. Um, and also, a key issue seems to be the point at which you can begin preparation for the qualifications. The issue, the issue about the extent to which you can use the broad general education phase for then pre preparation for qualifications. Um, I mean, this is all. There's, there's no intentional policy stated anywhere um, that there would be a reduction. Um, I, I think it's all, all really the unintended consequence. So, could, could I just clarify? Are, are you disputing the implication that was provided to us by Education Scotland, who seem to imply that um, the one of the reasons for the reduction that has definitely taken place, and I think we have a, a lot of evidence to suggest the extent of that evidence, um, particularly in different parts of Scotland too. Are, are you saying that uh, that has happened um, with the sort of unintended uh, consequences? There's been no direction about that? Or you know, why, why have we ended up in a situation? I think it is unintended consequences, schools. Um, the way in which they've had to interpret um, national guidance. And indeed, I think in 2016, Education Scotland had to issue new guidance on um, the way in which the broad general education and senior phases knit, to, knit together because schools, um, because uh, course choices had been reducing. But even with that new guidance, um, if you read it, I think it's still um, quite unclear the, the extent to which learning in the broad general education phase can prepare young learners for, for progression to national qualifications. So if that's correct, do you think that the, the structure of the system uh, is wrong? Um, I certainly think the perhaps the, the lack of guidance on, on this key issue seems to have um, meant that obviously schools and local authorities have been somewhat left their own devices. Um, and as I said, whilst Education Scotland have maybe tried to rein that back in with their guidance in um, 2016, which said schools should be doing between six and eight subjects, I still, looking at that guidance, you can you can get the impression that it would still be quite unclear to, to schools and local authorities just actually what that means for um, preparation at the broad general education phase in terms of preparing pupils for, for going in on to senior phase qualifications. Uh, Professor Scott, can I just ask you, in, in light of all the very extensive evidence that you've done school by school, uh, and obviously local authority by local authority, could I ask you uh, why you think we have had this uh, very considerable reduction 
in subject choice and particularly why it has affected some uh, local authority areas more than others? Yeah, it's actually quite difficult to answer that, as, as I suspect you know. Um, I completely agree with what William has just said about the lack of intention in all this. What has happened is that there were several factors that affect this. One is that some local authorities have mandated their schools, almost without exception, to do six courses in S4. That's really the only mandating that has gone on. That's a virus which spread round the north of Scotland from Angus in uh, a fan shape right round the north. And then there were outbreaks of it in the south and southwest of Scotland. There has been a, a ripple of infection, if you care to follow my analogy, through the central belt. But the central belt is still largely produce a curriculum for your school which meets the needs of your learners, which is what I thought we were all about in the beginning. And it's certainly what the Deputy First Minister says on a regular basis. So that's a major factor in terms of the number of schools doing six. Roughly half of Scotland's secondary schools are doing six courses in S4. Uh, the ones who are doing seven have generally chosen that as a more sensible position to stand in a tighter curricular space because they only have S4 to play with for the first course. Doing eight would be a challenge. When I was head teacher of Perth High School, I chose to move to seven. I chose because it was a sensible compromise between the dangers of six, and I'll, I'll spell those out in a second, and the dangers of eight because the pressure on children who would be squeezed to do eight subjects in the period of time available would be difficult. The, the six course um, choice, if choice is the right word, came, I understand, from interviews with the great and the good of Scottish education um, that said that a group of members of ADES had decided that that was the best way to do it. Now, I have no way of substantiating that. That's what I was told. It would be interesting to ask Ades that question. Um, I haven't tried. Um, the, the, the problems, to some extent, um, lie with the fact that if you do seven, it's perfectly possible to do seven in the time. If one reads HMI reports on Scottish secondary schools and one looks at the six course schools and the seven course schools, there is no evident difference in the pattern of inspections across the two models. The question I always ask myself, therefore, is if you can do seven in the time, why do you not just do seven? Um, if you're doing six because you want to introduce something else, then there has to be evidence of the something else. And you alluded to my map of the Scottish curriculum. There, there is little evidence of new infill in terms of vocational or other courses. So one has to then ask the question, <clears throat> why is it that schools are doing six courses or worse five unless they're being mandated by a local authority? If they're being mandated by a local authority, what is the rationale of a local authority for doing that? I spent a great deal of time, uh, as some of you in the room know, trying to find out exactly what each of the 32 local authorities was up to in terms of what is the rationale of this authority in doing it? From 32 authorities researching every single document, I mean every document, right down to every committee paper from every committee since 2008, um, I managed to find three curricular policies across 32 authorities. Now, I'm sure there are more, but they're not in a public place. Of the three, one was a pre-CFE policy. I did the same thing with schools, looking for curricular rationales to explain why this was happening. Roughly 15 to 20 per cent of Scotland secondary schools produce a rationale. Can I just finish on one, one question, uh, Professor Scott? Given what you're saying about councils mandating um, schools to uh, take a particular line, could I just push you a little bit? Do, do you believe that that is in the spirit of Curriculum for Excellence, which is supposed to be designed uh, you know, to suit individual uh, needs, so that the, the educational journey, if you like, is fitting the best interests of that child and that school? Do you think that's an appropriate policy, that councils take a, a, a one-size-fits-all policy to the, the actual structure of their curriculum? The, the short answer has to be no, <clears throat> because necessarily you're lumping all children in one direction into one model which may or may not meet their needs. Worryingly, that model has significant flaws, because uh, I've done some research on a number of authorities recently, not published yet. I think some of you know I have several papers coming. But that research tends to suggest that I don't have a wide enough sample yet to prove it's true. 
But that research tends to suggest that in authorities where six columns and six subjects are the presentation, the actual number of qualifications that the child sits is around five and sometimes less than five on average. One begins to wonder <clears throat> if there was a correlation between that and the absence of the five at three and five at four and five at five figures in national publication. One can get five at five if one digs about in council papers. But to, to answer the spirit of your question, I think it would be helpful to all of us, certainly to you, if we actually had a breadth of information. We've been driven into corners. We tend to talk about one plus qualification at level five on leaving. I have no problems about talking about leavers because I actually think that that has always been the purpose of education, is to allow children to leave us in education with a broad set of experiences and qualifications that meet their needs. I don't think that's changed with CFE. It certainly shouldn't be a change. But we, we tend to talk about one plus at five or one plus at six, and that does a number of things. I've been tracking schools that actually demonstrate the five at three, five at four, five at five figures. One can still find quite a lot of them if one digs. If you actually do that, you find surprising things. Um, by and large, they're doing a little better at five at five. So the more able are doing better, by and large. You know what I'm going to say next, don't you? This is not the case for the least able. And the whole purpose of this, or at least the final purpose of CFE, was to improve equity. It wasn't the original purpose of CFE. So we have a situation where I'll, I'll give you an example of an unnamed school, because I haven't published yet and I can't do that. But I have several schools in my collection where the five at three figure for that school in 2012, 2013, just before CFE, was in the 90s percent, as many schools were. I can show you schools where that figure has dropped to 60 odd percent, 50 odd percent, or even in a few cases, 40 odd percent. That's beyond acceptance. So there are a number of things where there are serious issues. I have to say there are other schools where the figures have been kept up or in some cases are even better. It's not a homogeneous process, this. And I think that really is the problem. And that, that's where your question came from, was I think, in all honesty, was the idea that are we actually getting a level of quality by doing this? And the answer, sadly, appears to be no. Just before we bring in Dr. Britton, can I just clarify, um, Professor Scott, um, in your analysis, are you only looking at the SQA levels? So for some of those pupils who, who aren't performing as well now, is there a possibility, as Education Scotland have said to us, that they'll be doing other curricular activity or maybe even modern apprenticeship college courses? I hate doing this because uh, Keir Bloomer describes this as the Blue Peter approach to curriculum planning, but if you'll forgive me. This is a map of the entire 357 secondary schools in Scotland. It has, there's no way you're going to reproduce this for your notes and you're not getting it. Um, but what it does is to demonstrate quite my apologies to the microphone. What it does is to demonstrate quite clearly, I think, that we have a situation where there is considerable variability. And I, I really find it difficult to say to you that anything is improving in this at all. Um, I'm sorry, I lost a bit of a thread there in the midst of unwrapping it. Could you just... it, it, it was just, um, as you said, the, 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 the figures you were giving were the, those about the, the reduction in, in the performance of the sort of less able students. Um, have you any way of tracking what non-SQA qualifications they yeah, might sorry, be doing? Yeah, that's right. I beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. When I got caught up in the microphone, I lost that. The, the, the answer is yes, I can, because mm -hmm. I can read quite clearly all the lesser SQA qualifications, some schools publish, not that many schools publish the attainment at all. Uh, it's a very small minority when you get right down to it, but some do actually publish other qualifications that they produce. But one can see it better when one actually examines their curricular structure. If you can see the, co the option choice form, which one often can, then you can see quite quickly which qualifications are being offered. That doesn't tell you how well they did in those, but one can actually see the extent to which a school is offering alternative provision. So, yes, school by school, I can track whether or not they're providing alternative provision. I have to say to you that there was quite a bit of alternative provision before CFE came in, and many schools have carried that forward into CFE and either enhanced it or not enhanced it. Um, what I appear to be finding is that the enhancements are fewer than the non-enhancements, and that is a little bit of a worry. 
Um, if I look at six columns, one of the problems in six columns, of course, is that they all get stacked up in the six columns. And so many options are piled up against each other in a way where if you have seven or eight, you're able to spread it out a bit more. But yes, I can track that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, apologies, Dr. Brett. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I feel that some of the conversation already and uh, the questions from Liz reinforce a, a point that I, I tried to convey in my submission last year and in, in my responses, but we still have not resolved who owns the curriculum in Scottish education. We've got a system of distributed responsibilities uh, and therefore quite opaque accountabilities. Uh, and so, yes, it's in the spirit of Curriculum for Excellence for schools, uh, uh, head teachers to be empowered and autonomous to make decisions around the curriculum. That is, and that is, moreover, part of the, the general ethos of Scottish education. Uh, but we've always had that tension between autonomy and central control. And that's the backdrop, I think, the more profound backdrop to everything that's happening, is we're still unclear about who owns it, is it, uh, and, and therefore who owns the responsibility for the outcomes. Um, because we, we, we talk about distributed leadership, we talk about uh, autonomy at, uh, at local level, um, and that was part of the thrust of uh, CFE. Uh, so th and that's the, the sense in which I've ca characterised it previously as unintended consequences, that the, the consequences emerge from uh, deep-rooted structures uh, of governance in Scottish education itself, which we've never resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Goldrith. Thank you, Good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to go back, Professor Scott, to your map that you showed us a, a minute ago um, with regards to the 357 secondary schools in Scotland. And I wonder if anyone ever undertook any evidence in the past with regard to standard grade and the different offers that were offered um, in S4 previously. For example, when I was studying my standard grades 20 years ago, I know you, you can't believe that, um, I was offered seven subjects. That was the base level offer from Madras College, a state school in St Andrews, Fife Council. A couple of years later, my middle sister comes along. She's offered eight subjects. A couple of years after that, my baby sister goes to Bill Baxter in Cooper, just down the road, again, a Fife Council school. She's offered nine subjects. This variability is surely not a new thing. Has it ever been mapped in the past? To, to some extent. Um, there are relatively few people insane enough to try and read uh, the writings of 357 secondary schools, I have to say. Uh, <coughs> it's not a quick process. It was much easier, however, to map it in the past because we were driven at that point in time by a reasonably, uh, up until the year 2000, when the, the yellow peril and its success of the white peril, <coughs> the curriculum guidelines for Scottish secondary teachers, uh, head teachers were revoked. Up until that point in time, by and large, a school should have been offering eight qualifications. That was the basic offer, since that seems to be the word for describing a curriculum these days. Um, Everybody had a set of MUN modes within their curriculum, and so therefore there was literacy, numeracy, social subjects, and so on. And we worked across the seven of those, and there was an eighth column. And a few inventive schools, I, I worked in a couple of them, also certificated other aspects of their work, either through SQA qualifications or through alternative qualifications. Um, but in terms of was there actually a map well, I don't actually think there's been a map of Scottish education until now at all without being cheeky about it. So probably that was not done, but you would not have seen the degree of variability at that time. I guess my point is, though, that there was variability under the previous system, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that um, from the, the outset. Um, and I also think that I wonder what your view might be about the subjects on offer at the moment potentially limiting subject options later after S4, for example. So, you know, my... So my sisters and I all studied different numbers of subjects because there were different numbers available. All three of us were able to set five hires. We were not disadvantaged. Are you suggesting that the current system disadvantages pupils at the end of S4, for example, because they're being offered less subjects? Um, I think it depends on how they do. I think the most stable will survive in any system. Um, and I actually think the most stable are prospering. <clears throat> I suggested earlier on that there was a danger that inequity was growing. <clears throat> and I think, in all honesty, that's because the most stable cope in any system, and if you give the most stable only seven or only six qualifications to do, then by and large they will use the time well. And so they will probably prosper in that system. The trouble comes if you're at the bottom end of a group. If you're at the bottom end of the most stable or the bottom end of the average or wherever, then you find it much tougher to do that. 
Um, I would think that a child in pretty much any school in Scotland, I have some reservations about those who are doing only five qualifications in S4. There are still about four of them, I think. Um, that is a problem because they were always very, very tight. One of them had a curriculum for a while that was English, mathematics, Gaelic native speakers and any two others that you fancy. And, and that isn't what I would call a Scottish curriculum. But if you look at the sixes, the sevens and the eights, assuming that the child manages to carry forward five subjects, if you don't manage to carry forward five subjects, that's a different matter, then they will be able to get five hours. I take in with one of the points you made there um, with regard to the most able will survive. I have a concern about the report that was published, I think, yesterday by Reform Scotland, which overtly focuses on the number of subjects. And my concern is, as a former teacher, that we are still obsessed with getting children to study more subjects um, at a younger age, well, at S4, and we're not considering how that impacts upon their mental health, particularly given the course requirements of N4 and N5, N4 requiring a national added, uh, an added value unit, NAT5 requiring an assignment, and all the extra burden that places on our pupils, never mind the mental health of our teaching profession as well. Has any analysis been you know, given to that? Because I know that pupils at the moment, and last night I sponsored a parliamentary reception um, with the Mental Health Foundation, our pupils are really struggling with some of the requirements of these courses. Are we really saying that actually they should be studying more subjects and therefore that's going to add to their, their you know, mental health issues potentially? Well, one has to ask, that there are so many factors here that apply. One could ask equally well if the addition of a third two-term dash to the previous two has significantly increased the pressure upon young people. And my suspicion, having talked to quite a lot of young people, is that the answer there is yes. I, I arrived in Perth High School in 1998, and at that point in time, the five higher figure was 6%. Now, this is an upper middle class secondary school. It's uh, very comfortable. When I left Perth High School, um, the figure, without killing anyone in the process or causing serious damage to them, was about 24%. And it really depends on how one focuses the learning of young people. That's something we did for the most able. I equally well could talk to you about the way in which we introduced college courses for our middling group of children, vocationally based courses for others. It really depends on what a head teacher, their colleagues and their community choose to take forward. Um, I'd like to ask just a final point, sorry, convener, and it's a practical question to the whole panel um, about how we solve this issue, because we're here to try and, and help, I suppose, the system at this moment in time as a committee. Um, and I want to go back to William Hardy's point about hours allocation. I raised this point with the, the last panel before recess, um, because I was quite taken, Professor Scott, you spoke about um, the sixth course choice came from ADIS. That wasn't my understanding of it. My understanding as a former teacher was that the six course choice option um, actually was driven by hours allocation from the SQA. And if you look at that 160 hours allocation, obviously it's only possible in one year to timetable, I think, 5.3 subjects, given that there are 855 teaching hours. So you have to start a bit earlier if you want to give a bigger offer of subjects. So, you know, we've heard from um, the Scottish Association of Geography teachers, they want to go back to the 222 model. Jim Scott, I think you suggested in your previous school, you had seven subjects as the offer in S4. Um, I'd really be interested in what the panel thinks is the answer to this. Can I just deal with the ADS bit, first of all? It, it would be wrong with me to name the director of education concerned. I could. Um, but my understanding is that one director of education carried out some, what I would call, timetabling 101 work um, and did some simple calculations along the lines of those you were talking about there and decided that that was all that could be carried out in the time. I'd prefer to look at someone I'm happy to name, uh, Maureen McKenna in Glasgow, who I think is exemplary. I think her work is excellent. HMI have recently agreed with that. Her documentation on CFE very clearly says to her head teachers and colleagues, you need to consider third year carefully. You need to use third year wisely. There are experiences and outcomes that can be undertaken in third year, which will set you up well for progress in fourth year and allow you and it, it, since you mentioned Keir's document of yesterday, Glasgow's response to that document was, we do not impose a system on our schools. We allow them to consider their opportunities and needs, and we allow them to build a curriculum that meets those needs. My old friend Jerry Lyons in two of Glasgow's secondary schools um, has chosen to go for six courses. His curriculum is almost exactly the same as mine Perth High School because we did them together, uh, but he has managed to squeeze it into six columns. 
So it's really a matter of how you think you should best meet the needs of your children. But it's not a matter of the number of minutes, because if one uses third year wisely, there are more than sufficient minutes. OK. Uh, I'm going to, to cop out of providing an answer on the technical dimensions t to this, because you know there are there's lots of different possible models. But I suppose what I can offer from my perspective is how you go about arriving at that solution, and and I think that's critical. Uh, your own report yesterday, as a committee on uh, the uh, national tests, you know, identified some of the issues about policy implementation, and I think that's really where we're at now. Is how how do you uh, implement policy more effectively? And that would be the case for this uh, scenario as well, where I think what do you do to solve it? Well, you talk to head teachers, uh, te head teachers who feel uh, free to talk to you. Uh, without any restriction in what they have to say. Uh, I think alongside that, as Jim suggests, there's, there's expertise out there on resolving timetabling. Uh, it would be very difficult to propose a one-size-fits-all solution uh, and you know, it wouldn't be appropriate, in, uh, I think, in the, the, that spirit of Scottish education governance that I mentioned before, to legislate for, for something. You know, that, and again, that's one of the tensions in the Scottish system. Sometimes we legislate in education, other times we try to enact change pure through policy, but you know it's a quite a grey area. When does it become legislation? When does it become policy? So I, I'm not. I don't think you can necessarily legislate for it. But what you can do is work with the profession in different ways. Uh, look at the impact as well in a much more systematic way. You know, again, I've made the point before. I think that we're operating in, uh, absent. You know, Jim's work and a few other people. We actually have very little. Uh, research evidence on the impact of the different models. So schools have been left to, to try things out based on very sound local judgment, almost certainly, uh, but there is very little evidence. So I think we need to have all of those uh, things in place in order to arrive at the solution. I mean, I um, agree with my colleagues on the panel there. Um, clearly, we don't want to mandate particular models at this stage because you could start getting into other unintended consequences. So I very much support uh, what Alan said there in relation to the need for more research in terms of what different structures and pathways pathways mean for attainment. Um, and I mean, I think this what happens in, in the third year is, is clearly key in terms of providing that preparation for qualifications and the potential for, for doing also We've, we've spoken a lot around um, doing the qualifications over one year, and Jenny, you, you mentioned that the stresses that could could bring on pupils. Um, so potentially, to what extent are, are two two year courses um, um, currently being run? Because my impression is that the one year course is the the, the the dominant approach. But perhaps again, this comes back to the need for more research. But looking at um, what what two year pathways look like and what that means for for. for the, the, the number of qualifications that can be taken and also for attainment and also what it means for the learners' uh, well-being as well. OK. Uh, Ms Harris. Good morning, gentlemen. I would really like to ask you about the issues surrounding multi-level teaching and whether you think the courses are actually designed to support this method. Well, I mean, this is an issue that the also as well as supporting the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Education Committee I also support the Learning Societies Group, which brings together the Learning Scientific Society, so the Institute of Physics, Royal Society of Chemistry, Royal Society of Biology. We've also got Computing Science and, and Maths as well, and one or two others. And multi-course teaching um, seems to be a particular issue um, in the sciences, because whilst courses may have similar, similar titles, um, a National Four and, and physics will be very different from the National 5 course in physics, but quite often they'll be taught together, um, which can obviously impact on the quality of teaching if a teacher's got to co um, teach quite different um, um, classes. And sometimes that can even be exacerbated by having um, you know, National 4, National 5 and higher um, in the same classes. I mean, and this also... Obviously, it touches upon the, the difficulty of recruiting um, 
um, subject specialist teachers, and particularly in the sciences, and you know, computing science is a, mm. a is a notable area, which means that some, in some schools, multi-course teaching may well be the only way that the school can timetable those courses um, to allow them to be run, to be run. Um, I do. I was just going to add. I mean, this is an issue that the Learning Societies Group um, raised. I think back in 2016. Um, with SQA Education Scotland and the government. Um, so they're aware of the issue. Um, and I think there was at that time, um, I don't know if I go as far as a commitment, but certainly there'd be a dialogue between Education Scotland and local authorities to highlight that multi course teaching was um, undesirable in the mm -hmm. sciences. But as far as I can tell, I'd, I'm just not aware of any action having been undertaken since then. Um, and as far as I can tell, uh, the issue of multi-course teaching is as prevalent now um, as it was when the Learning Societies originally raised this issue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Dr. Brenton no, had indicated he was going to come in first. Sorry, thank you. I suppose the simplest response is, uh, would any teacher actively choose to construct their teaching and learning in that way? Uh, and while there are some relatively weak pedagogical arguments for multi-level teaching, the notion of peer support within the class and so on. I think the reality is for most uh, teachers uh, that if they were given a choice between multi-level teaching or not, they wouldn't want it. So clearly, again, this is where I think it's important to speak to head teachers and identify the, uh, the resource allocations that are driving uh, the inevitability of uh, multi-level teaching. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, Professor Scott. The, the, um, we're actually making three different points, which is helpful. But what, one of the things that concerns me based on what I've done in the last couple of years is the extent to which tri-level teaching is still prevalent in places. It tends to be prevalent in minority subjects or in smaller schools or both. Uh, but it is a genuine issue. Um, I have quite a lot of write-in mail unexpectedly. Uh, from teachers who want to tell me about the situation in their school. It's very good for statistics, but one gets the, the, the other things as well. And one of the things that, interestingly, geography teachers who have featured this morning seem to be particularly exercised about, but some others as well, is this concept of tri-level teaching. As William said with the sciences, it, it's a no-no, or it should be a no-no. Um, but it does seem to be prevalent in quite a lot of the smaller subjects. And given the pressures on the last couple of columns in six course schools, there is a tendency to jam a lot of things in there. And that seems to have led to more tri level teaching. Okay, well, you know, my question was basically because of many parents that have actually been writing to me and they're very concerned about it. So, you know, I did want to hear, you know, your opinions on it because, you know, from a personal perspective, I really don't see how it can work, how you can teach a child in S4 and a child in S6. I just, I think you're, you're stretching the teacher very, very far. But thank you. Your, your opinions are you interesting. Uh, sorry, I didn't realise you meant across uh, different year groups. So that's, that's even more difficult. Right. Sorry, may uh, I actually be more specific? Much, much less common, I think, but um, very difficult to do because if, if I'm a computing teacher, a mathematics right. teacher, okay. if I were attempt to attempt to teach advanced higher computing, higher computing and uh, national fire computing in one room, there would be a significant challenge. Okay. Even for the most okay. able kids. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. move to Ms. Lamont. Yep. Um, thank you very much. And I really wanted to come back to this issue, first of all, about multi-level. I mean, I suppose I'm interested in, in a lot of what's been described here is about quality of education for all our young people. But I wonder, I think it's a particular issue around if it's an unintended consequence, but actually our most disadvantaged young people are even more disadvantaged in this system. I want to ask you, first of all, therefore, about this multi-level question, maybe Dr Britton in particular, because you, you'll be dealing with um, people in in Teacher, initial teacher education. Um, William Hardy already said that there'd be an obvious impact on the quality of teaching and having multi-level classes. We were told by Education Scotland this was not the case, that it was all about the quality of the teaching. So I suppose I want to ask you, first of all, to what extent is that now factored in into initial teacher education, that they may be asked to teach across different levels? Is there any work being done at looking at the how prevalent it is, because I understand, you know, from one family background, small schools in uh, remote areas, 
where you get a secondary school and that makes a huge difference and of course there's going to be compromise in that. But I've been told in my own city in Glasgow that it happens routinely across subjects. It didn't happen to back in the day long ago when I was a teacher 20 odd years ago. So I suppose I'm asking, how are we supporting teachers to address this? And secondly, how prevalent is it? Okay, well, the, the prevalence issue, I, I, I don't have the data on that. You know, colleagues may well have, have that. Uh, in terms of the preparation of, of teachers, uh, initial teacher education uh, will we'll do what it can, I think, to, uh, to prepare uh, beginning teachers for the different scenarios that they will encounter. Of course, you know, our students uh, will go out to potentially 32 different local authorities with different uh, local authority level approaches, and then you drill that down to individual schools. And of course, uh, there's such a wide variety, so uh, you can't necessarily prepare them for every eventuality. Uh, but what you try to do, I think, is introduce the notion that, well, for example, in uh, the primary sector, they may well encounter in smaller rural schools teaching a, a composite P1 to P4 class and a P5 to P7 class. Uh, and what you do is you, you uh, introduce the notions of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I have to say, I have seen uh, superb examples in the past of uh, of that peer-to-peer -peer learning being done in small uh, primary schools, for example. In secondary schools, the preparation really, I think, uh, is about uh, giving them the policy context. They actually have to know uh, what they're going out to. Particularly, uh, that is difficult, though, for the secondary teachers who are uh, certainly in Glasgow University uh, recruited through the one-year programme, the PGDE. Uh, so you don't have a lot of time in that uh, one year, which half of which is spent out in schools, to prepare them. We, we prepare them as best we can. Uh, if they're subject specialists in the secondary, each subject uh, specialist input will try to uh, prepare them for the reality of possibly multi-level teaching. Uh, so they'll learn about the different levels, the different qualifications, and what's involved in those. Um, and you give them ideas about how to uh, teach across different levels. I mean, that is nothing new in the secondary sector in the sense that, you know, in the, the 90s, I taught uh, O grade and then standard grades, and you would often have a foundation general or a general in credit class. But I suppose it goes back to my point, optimally, most teachers would say you would have taught a credit class, a general class, and a foundation with the understanding that there could be transitions within those levels. But you wouldn't ever have taught a higher class, or very rarely have taught a higher class and a standard grade class at Credit General Foundation, which is what I'm no, being told is now happening. But there, and it's would, happening more routinely yeah, than it did in the past. You would get higher, and the intermediates did often come together. Can I ask, do you think there's an equity issue in this? So, way back in the day, tiny percentage of the kids in the schools that I taught in stayed on to fifth year. Tiny proportion. The school I taught in, you could cobble together a higher class, but it was a wide range of ability. Whereas maybe in a, a secondary school up the road, they would have five classes doing higher English, and the ones who were doing, who were going to be predicting A would be 25 of them, and down. Is there an issue in more disadvantaged communities that they're more likely to be taught in multi-level classes because there are fewer of them and their chances therefore of achieving their potential is more limited than their peers who are in a school with 25 kids who are all predicted to get an A in their higher English. I mean, I don't have that data. I don't know if anyone else has. Uh... Yeah. I mean, I don't have that specific data on the um, how prevalent it is in terms of disadvantaged schools, but I think it does come back to the issue of um, the difficulty of recruiting teachers, and particularly in short subjects. And as I mentioned before, the sciences um, seem to be particularly an area where multi-course teaching is employed. And it may well be schools in the disadvantaged areas may well be, find it more difficult to recruit some of these short, short subjects, um, perhaps against other schools who also need them, them but maybe in, more, uh, in, in less disadvantaged areas. So there might be that. In terms of... Um, the prevalence and the availability of data. I mean, the last um, piece of work I'm aware of is the Royal Society of Chemistry undertook work, work in this area in 2016, um, just focused on chemistry. And this, and this was included in the Learning Society's group submission to, to yourselves in paragraph 20. Um, it provides a short summary. But that research revealed that um, multi-course classes um, 
were prevalent in 73% of National 5 classes, um, and the most common pattern was National 5 being combined with National 4, and this was a survey of um, 259 chemistry teachers. And that, and, that reveal, and that made clear from that survey that teachers um, felt it was very difficult to support the needs of the different students across these different levels within the same class. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said earlier, I mean, this is an issue that we know Scottish Government Education Scotland and SQA, SQA are aware of, um, but, to, but to what extent any action has been taken to address it since we well, raised it with them back in 2016, I, I just don't know at this, this I point. I just wonder if you would share my concern that Education Scotland did not think it was a problem and have not done any analysis whatsoever, no quality impact assessment, which would, in my view, would show that more disadvantaged young people are more likely already, way back in the day, are still more likely to be in multi-level classes and I mean, less support than they would with their peers who are more advantaged. I mean, I would, share, I would certainly share the concern if... Um, Education Scotland are, are, are turning their ears away from it, given that it's been an issue that's been flagged up, and they're certainly aware of the, the work and issues that the Learning Society Group um, raised with them. So it's, it is clearly an issue. Is your view then that the driver in this is shortage of teachers has then become, well, we can do this anyway? I mean, how, I think, I mean does I that think, become a vicious circle? I think, yeah, we can put them all together so we don't actually have to find these teachers. Yeah, I mean, th th there might be issues with the school management as well. If they, they might not necessarily know the the differentiation between the different courses, and because they might have, it might superficially look like similar content, or we'll put them together when it's quite clearly um, that that's very difficult to do. Yeah, I'm just going to bring in Professor Scott. I'm, I'm quite cautious normally about. I don't mind answering questions when I've got the entire set of data sitting in front of me. And you're asking, as you know, a particularly difficult question. Um, most of my writing or most of my interviews with teachers indicate that this seems to be a growing problem. It seems to be a growing problem that comes from several sources. Some of them indicate it's local authority staffing levels. Some of them indicate it's the head teacher slash senior management team's view of the curriculum that puts them in a particularly difficult position. And they may be qualified to state that, but I don't know that. I can only hear what they have to say. Some of them say, probably with more accuracy, that it comes from their principal teacher who wants to do it this way to make more space and time for that, although that should be moderated by the senior management team. The, the Education Scotland question you ask is, is a really hard one because uh, if I heard correctly, the Chief Executive, when she gave evidence there, um, said that they were only just starting, restarting aspect inspections. What, one of the things that one would normally expect in a major educational initiative, and I've lived through a few of them, is that there is a rolling inspection process and HMI were you know, were the pride of the world in terms of the way in which they rigorously carried out these things. Scotland had a right to be proud of that. And those of us who were inspected by them didn't always feel that way, but they did it very thoroughly. I was aspect inspected in Perth High School in November 2011, almost the last thing I did in Perth High School. And I had assumed that that would roll onwards, but it obviously hasn't. And normally what happens is that aspect inspections and school inspections build up. And one needs that parcel of inspection evidence. Um, HMI inspect, what, um, a dozen secondary schools a year or something like that? <clears throat> if, you give them, if you give them 10 years, they'll manage about 100 secondary schools, and the first half of the evidence is obsolete by then. So it is quite difficult to actually get a feel for what's going on unless you carry out aspect inspections to really drill down into aspects of the major initiative that's being carried through. And normally what comes from that then is one of the portmanteau reports that says, here we are in curriculum for excellence, this is how it's going. Unless I've missed something completely, there isn't a, here we are in CFE, this is how it's going. So I, I think we have a problem here in terms of how we are actually assessing ourselves in terms of how it goes forward. The, the geography teachers and science teachers and other teachers who write in all feel that they're the losers in this process, and that's one of the reasons they're raising this. But if they're all losers, maybe there's a wider problem. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask um, one last question, I think, on um, 
uh, Professor Scott's uh, report, where I think the most troubling, and there's lots of really, really interesting stuff, and it's clearly um, merits a, a great deal of, of attention. But in one point in your report, you say, um, in some local, and sometimes as, um, this appears to substantiate the suggestion that equity may have been adversely affected by curriculum for excellence. What can we do to... I mean, I'm in danger of looking back to a golden age of standard grade because the transition from non-certificate to standard grade was so significant for a significant number of young people completely written off the non-certificate course. My great fear is we create... Yes, they're doing courses, but they're non-certificated, so we go back to that day where they get less attention. What can we do? That seems to me to be a huge challenge. That if I, I don't think it's intended consequence, but an unintended consequence is that those who were supposed to be supported most by certification for all are now losing out in a curriculum for excellence which is supposed to be designed around equity. What can we do to address that? I wish I had an easy answer for that. Um, I, I, a glib answer would be to say, do what OECD said in 2015 and go back and carry out a thorough mid-session review of CFE, consider what it's actually trying to do and how it should go forward. And why that was... I, I, again, I heard the CEO of Education Scotland say that they were getting round to that. And, well, OK, they have other priorities, but four years on from a massive international report and they're getting round to it, it seems to be quite a serious issue. Um, my personal view is that it will be difficult to resolve the problem in those areas where six courses are mandated. And that's because their options have been so narrowed and the six becomes five or four and they are really in trouble right away. Those children are not being given a chance. <clears throat> I understand that some basic timetabling led some people, whether they were directors or head teachers or whoever, to make these choices. But they should have been more informed. And part of the problem, um, I think I got the unintended consequences title first on, on the thesis about this way back in 2014, because it's been obvious for that length of time that there were these problems building up. I remember Dr Allen and I used to talk in another parliamentary committee about the modern languages problem because it was evident from quite early that some of these things were going off the rails. How we put it back together is not simple because it's a bit like turning a super tanker or the Titanic. It really takes 15 to 20 years to launch and steer a major educational initiative. You can't just do that. And so whatever we do now will have to be a process of planning and organisation and it will take time. And I share your concern because if this is a process that's designed to help children from deprived backgrounds and children in difficulties and young carers and all the other contexts that we've talked about, to come up alongside those young people who have all the advantages in the universe anyway, then if we allow that to drift for another five years whilst we sort out something to go forward with, we're in serious trouble. Um, we're in danger of a generation going past who have not had a good experience in education. The only thing we can do, however, is honestly debate what the findings are. I would personally release the five at three, five at four, five at five figures for every school in Scotland. I would personally release the extent of planning, organisation and leadership by every one of the 32 local authorities, because that's a very mixed picture, as I suspect you all understand. That would give us some basis alongside the lever statistics, which are very helpful, and alongside some of the other stats that we have, I would also try to ensure that all the qualifications that children get, whether SQA or not, are actually publicly available so we can see how schools are doing. And I would also insist that you are responsible for legislation in 2012 and 2013 that required every secondary school and every local authority by statute to produce information on attainment and information on the curriculum. I can tell you, uh, if you've read any of my research at all, you know that this is not happening. And it's not happening massively. Some whole authorities are not doing it, and many individual schools are not doing it. They're better at publishing their curriculum, but that pretty little map there has a big stripe down the, the end of it, that stripe. And where the box is green, they publish their curriculum. Where the box is white, and look at that, all white, all white, all white they do not publish the curriculum at all, and there are bits in between that. 
I did exactly the same thing with attainment. The percentage of Scottish secondary schools that publishes their attainment for parents to see so that they can understand how well the school is doing is a small minority. They don't even, in many cases, bother to say, by the way, if you go to parents' own, there's a link there to some of the information. It just isn't there. So there are things we can do now to allow the public debate to happen much more effectively. We could do that this week. I don't think we will, but we could do that this week. And then there's a harder job of trying to plan something quickly over the year or two to pick up the pieces of what should be an excellent initiative and actually turn it into something that does the job it was supposed to do. Bring in Ms. Goldruth. I, mean, I just want to pick up briefly on <clears throat> excuse me, Joanne Lamott's point with regard to equity, which I think is really important. And you know, Jim Scott, you spoke about children not being given a chance. I do think we need to reflect upon what came before curriculum for excellence and what happened um, before the present day. So in a school I taught in, in Edinburgh until, well, 2014, uh, the policy there up until about 2012 was that in the preliminary examinations, which would happen before the final exam, unless a pupil obtained 33%, uh, they could not go forward and set a higher qualification, for example. So we used to discount a huge number of pupils, I have to say, and actually there was a, a large number, of, well, who were just kind of moved to the side and it wasn't fair. They didn't have a chance to succeed. And the school changed their policy, Edinburgh Council changed the policy to focus on poverty and actually to give these kids a chance. Um, do you recognise that? Do you think we've moved away from that? Or do you think that, you know, actually the system is enshrining inequality? Because I don't recognise some of what's being discussed this morning. I think actually our schools are working really hard to give all pupils an opportunity to succeed in a way that actually 10, 20 years ago they just didn't do. Yeah, but bizarrely, Jenny, I think you and I are actually saying exactly the same thing in different ways. Um, I, I don't think anyone disputes that all schools are working their socks off and trying very hard to do the job. But you need to look at the advice they've been given, the supportive framework or not that they've been provided with, and the ways in which head teachers have then actually taken that forward, either individually or as a group within the local authority and with their colleagues in the school and with their community. Try going and reading the um, parent council minutes of every parent council in Scotland and see how many of them have been involved in consultation about the curriculum. Um, I'm not going to state that here because I haven't published it yet and I'm still adding it up. It's not a high number. Um, I recognise what you're saying about schools discounting children, but I've already said to you this morning that that process is still happening. Children in six columns are ending up doing five or four or less. If the average is 4.7 and you start with six, obviously some of them are doing two or three. So we are still doing that process of discounting children from what they set out to do. Where is the skill of it? I shouldn't be asking this of a teacher, but I will anyway. Where is the skill of the teacher and the people who support the teacher in the, in the upper echelons ha -ha, of the school? Where is the skill of making sure that the child who starts on the journey actually ends the journey successfully? That's the learning and teaching part of the process. Whatever the structure that that operates in, there has to be good learning and teaching. And part of what we all seem to be getting from people is that they're not certain, they're unsure. I quoted very deliberately the Glasgow City Council handbook to support CFE that Maureen McKenna had produced because it's one of the highest quality ones in Scotland. In many authorities, there is no such handbook at all. There is no advice from the authority for the schools. I cannot find that in most of Scotland's, uh, most of Scotland's authorities. So schools are operating in a complex environment in which the natural supports one would turn to, HMI for long-term advice on how things are going, it's not there. One would turn to the local authority for policy, training and support, it may or may not be there. One would turn to a consortium arrangement of schools to work together, sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. You would recognise all these things from your previous experience. So we have a situation where this should be a world-class initiative. It has the potential to be a world-class initiative. What the first committee started with in terms of the four capacities and a view of education, I've debated with a few people in this room, and I don't think any of us disagreed other than to say this is a good idea. But the implementation process has gone in various directions, and somewhere a lot of the teachers and head teachers and local authorities have been left behind. I very carefully evaluate a couple of Scottish local authorities professionally because my role was their chief external evaluator. And I can't talk about those authorities because that's commissioned work. 
But I can tell you within those authorities, if I speak to head teachers, deputy head teachers or teachers, there will not be a homogeneous understanding of CFE in any of the authorities I deal with. There will not be a homogeneous view of how certain groups of young people can be supported effectively. And that really shouldn't be happening because if I look back to the higher store training process, Mrs. Perry may have shipped out furniture van loads of CDs to everyone, and we may all have complained about that, but at least we had supportive materials to work with. This time we're working in what is at best a partial vacuum. Yes, okay. yes just following on really from that. Um, I'm just wondering where you think the guidance and support should come from. You know, is, is there a bigger role for Education Scotland, uh, the SQA or the Scottish Government? And I, I hear what you said, Dr Britton, about not mandating. But should there be a mandate to schools to say five is too low? Um, because that might, you know, then raise... I mean, if some schools can do seven and eight, coming from a non-educational background, I can't understand why some the rest of the schools can't do that. So... Should, should there be, a, you know, and where does that where does that come from? Well, I mean, an interesting illustration of the question of mandating comes in the the document that I think William referred to earlier on, Education Scotland's uh, guidance on progression from the broad general edu education to the senior phase. And the point is that you know that the language of this as a document is is guidance first of all, and throughout you see the word should. Um, Sorry, just to stop you, what document is that? You know? It's, uh, I mean, I can make it available to the official it's, it's report just, afterwards. Who's, who's, who's but saying? it's from Education Scotland. Education Scotland, sorry. Uh, and it's, it's guidance for schools, local authorities and their partners. Um, but the, the point I was making is it's, it's in the language of this and it's, it's throughout the, 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 the word is should. And it, it can't be must because of the nature of Scottish education and how uh, governance is distributed. Uh, but I think... Uh, what you can do is you can provide uh, a more coherent approach to uh, informing the profession. Uh, I think uh, Jim's absolutely right, uh, and we've spoken about this before, that uh, there was a failure, I think, to clearly communicate from the outset uh, of uh, the review group uh, report in 2004, um, and it has coincided, it's been that perfect storm of losing the local authority uh, capacity to, to provide the, the policy translation effect, uh, which was uh, there previously around things like higher still and standard grade 5 to 14, where you had that middle uh, cadre of people in the system who uh, were able to take high level guidance and interpret and provide schools with ways to implement them that were consistent and therefore you had um, it was a cascade model to some extent, but also operated in both directions. So a policy could be cascaded from above, but equally information from uh, from the ground up was being fed up into the system. Uh, and I think that that middle layer has largely gone. The OECD highlighted that in their report as well. Uh, I mean, one of the possible uh, ways forward is through the, the regional improvement collaboratives. Uh, I think that's at least in an attempt to, to re-establish uh, a layer that's sustainable uh, in the, the current uh, climate uh, to provide that regionalised support for uh, policy implementation and helping uh, head teachers find their way around this. Okay. Thank you. Professor Scott? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's easy to kick Education Scotland. It's not difficult. They provide several opportunities, and I hate to say that. However, they do have a key and important role, and that key and important role is to be the focus of it. They ought to be the marketplace of Scottish education. The training, the development work, it should all come together there to some extent, I'm not suggesting they should run it all. But they don't seem to have fulfilled that function for the past several years. There was a, like Joanne, I, I, I have to be careful of gold mirrors in the past. Um, there weren't in LTS, it has to be said, so ES is not necessarily a worse product than the one before. Um, but realistically speaking, under Learning and Teaching Scotland, they had a number of very useful things. They, they had Eddie Broadley, who was, by anybody's standard, a curriculum expert who could stand on a platform and convey it. Eddie and I ran around Scotland for a couple of years trying to help people to understand what CFE was about. They had ICT people who were of high quality. They had a number of other people who, if supported appropriately and brought to the fore, 
were capable of doing the job that we've acquired to be done right now. They also had in Ken Muir, who was Chief Inspector Curriculum at that time, someone who understood root and branch Scottish education and was able to work with other people and facilitate it. All of these people have moved on. Without defaming their successors in any way, it used to be the case that the inspectorate in particular had a conveyor belt of people who rose up through the system. The, the lesser ones sort of fled to the sides like the chaff and strong people came to the top. There has been something of a discontinuity in the inspectorate in recent years, and we haven't necessarily seen that continuity of expertise and ability. And I, I hesitate to say that of an agency which has done immensely good things for Scottish education, but we just seem to have blurred the edges a little bit. The, the short answer to your question is that the curricular side of Education Scotland, which is now being re-strengthened belatedly, but which went through a very difficult period for a while, it seemed, and the inspectorate side probably need to come together with local authorities who need to start to put together the expertise that my colleagues have talked about dis disappearing in recent years. If we can build that, then we should be in a position where we can take this forward. But what can't be done is it can't be done by three civil servants in an office down the road in Victoria Quay. It has to be done in a much more systematic way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Creer. Come here. Um, could I just start off by asking the panel, what is your understanding of the link between deprivation SIMD status and the offering, uh, the number of hires average, uh, offered on average in a Scottish secondary school? Uh, Mr. Gray, I'm not, I don't really know in terms of the, the hire offering, but um, research, research clearly shows that um, the schools that attend to do offer fewer courses at S4 are, are those and uh, tend to be in more deprived areas. Um, and so it would leave me to believe that that would roll, roll into higher provision as well, um, although I don't, have, I don't have the data for that. Well, again, I'm, I'm just referring to the Reform Scotland report that came out yesterday, which is, a, you know, you could extrapolate from that uh, potentially in relation to, you know, I'm looking at particular local authorities here, Eastern Bartonshire, for example, all appear to offer eight, um, and you might be able to extrapolate further from that into the, the context at higher, but I, I, I don't have the data. Again, it's an example though where we need this information as a system. Uh, everyone needs it. I, I, I could probably tell you school by school, but I can't do an instant add up. Uh, if, if you want to ask me at the end what that actually comes to, I'm happy to do that. Um, obviously, it is the case that those who offer seven or eight um, are often areas with slightly more advantaged pupils, and that leads them to keep higher numbers of courses because they think they can get it through, and that tends to mean that they have higher numbers doing five hires. But that's the demography of the situation, not the curriculum structure. Mm. To, to move slightly from the, the number of hires that people could take at one time to the, the number that they are offered, the Times did a bit of work on this around about 18 months ago um, and found uh, their understanding is that schools in the most deprived communities in Scotland will offer on average a choice between 17 different higher subjects. Schools in the least deprived communities will offer on average uh, something like 23 hires for pupils to choose from. Does that correspond to your understanding of differences between deprived and uh, less deprived communities and, and the numbers that are offered? There's a chunk in my overly long report, which, <laughs> which I wrote quite clearly to, to demonstrate that. But if, if you're asking, is it the case that those who have more upmarket communities offer a wider choice of hires, then the answer is almost certainly yes. That's reassuring to know. When we had, um, or not reassuring to know, but it's reassuring to you say that, Professor Scott, because when we had Education Scotland here a couple of weeks ago, I posed exactly that question to them and I asked that, said, if, uh, does Education Scotland accept that if I were a pupil in one of Scotland's most deprived communities, I'd be offered a choice between roughly 17 hires. If I was in least deprived communities, I'd be offered roughly 23 hires. Does Education Scotland accept that that's the case? The response was, no, we do not accept that. Um, the wider response, the longer exchange can be seen in the official report, obviously. Um, 
What is your reaction to the fact that Education Scotland does not accept that there is a link between deprivation <coughs> and the breadth of subjects that are offered to pupils in our schools? I don't think it's my role as an academic to make comments about the leadership of Education Scotland, in all honesty. I, I have to say I was surprised. I listened with great interest um, to a number of things they said, in all honesty and found myself wondering if I lived in the same educational world. Um, beyond that, I really, really should not comment. It's their job to answer for what they have said and whether or not that was accurate. All I can say is I, I did not recognise their answer as a situation pertaining. Thank you. Mr Hardy? I mean, I was just really going to make a, a similar point to, to what Professor Scott said there. Clearly, the data that you refer to is based on research and work, work undertaken by, by the Times Higher. Um, and if Education Scotland are, are simply saying there's no link, but not, not substantiating, substantiating that, um, it may be an area which this committee might want to follow up with them and see whether they do have data um, which shows a different, um, shows a different answer. Um, but other than that, I've, I've, no further. I mean, I'm, I'm not in possession of data on this issue. Thanks. Um, and just one final uh, brief question. Again, this might not be something that you have immediately to hand. Um, Education Scotland referenced their understanding, their belief that that was not the case based on the attainment challenge reports that they have. Now, my understanding of the attainment challenge reports is that they would not back up Education Scotland's conclusion. If you take a broad overview of the ch uh, attainment challenge reports that we have so far, you're not led to the conclusion that schools in the least deprived communities have just as much on offer as, uh, as schools in the most deprived communities have just as much on offer as those in the least deprived. I mean, just carried out from part of analysis of the nine SAC authorities, I suppose this one's mine. Um, obviously, they, they have carried it out uh, to different standards. Um, two of them have been declared to be excellent. Two of them have been declared to be uh, whatever the current word for mediocre is and the remainder have been somewhere in between. And those that have done this job particularly well appear to have genuinely affected equity in a positive manner. Um, they do appear to offer coherent sets of choices, but I could take you to schools in some of the bottom end of the middling set who offer a significant choice, and other schools with exactly the same demography who are struggling to offer that same breadth of choice. The, the trouble is, when one sits in a committee like this, one makes grand statements about how it is. When you actually are a head teacher in a relatively run-down school at the back end of a city somewhere, not that these exist in Scotland anymore, but nevertheless, that head teacher may be facing a significant budget cut from a local authority. They might have had their entire SAC budget taken away by the local authority. But this is not unknown. They may be struggling to find teachers of certain subjects, even in the city, and it can be very complex. So the trouble is, there isn't one thing that causes this. It's often an accumulation of factors that build things up. And if you happen to be the unlucky school that's sitting there, and that's the epicenter of, of everything going wrong, you're the one who gets the, the, the bad situation. So it, it's very complex to give you an answer to that question. Thank you. Dr. Scott. Thank you. Collaboratives and understand whether they're making any difference to this discussion on subject choices across Scotland, given they are a relatively new part of the landscape in education. I mean, I think one view is it's very early days. Uh, I think they're still being established. But again, this is maybe the opportunity to, um, you know, to some extent, if you can set the agenda for those. Uh, regional improvement collaboratives as part of that wider ecosystem of uh, of governance. It's, it's important to be clear about what they can do, what they can't do, and the level of support that they provide. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier on that they can help to uh, potentially fill that uh, gap that's been left by the uh, evisceration of uh, support at local authority levels, but they, ca they can't do that on their own either. Uh, there has to be that whole systems approach. Uh, and there is a danger that that could lead to a further spiral uh, of local authorities further relinquishing uh, the support function that I think is still a really important part of the system, uh, because that's where you know the, 
the local democratic structures and oversight of education reside in, in the system as it's constructed. Uh, so it's, it, I think they will be part of the response, um, and perhaps you know the work of, of this committee can can feed into that as well. You know, you've you've you're raising a couple of a number of really important issues at the moment. Um, I think that's the way to move forward collectively. And and, and again, I made the point in my previous evidence to you that you know for me it's about it's none of this is about politicising any of this. You know, I, th I think it's about making the system work in ways where there's coherence across the board. Yeah, you, again, a very interesting question. Um, have you, well, sorry, I shouldn't be asking you questions. I, 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 have, I have stupidly read the, the RIC plans for almost all of the RICs, and that, that's an edifying experience of itself. Um, clearly, they are not homogeneous, once again, and, and we are bedeviled in a small country by a lack of homogeneity. I, I've been to China quite a few times, as Dr. Allen notes, and, and I don't particularly like the idea that on Thursday afternoon you're all doing that. that. That's not what Scotland is about. But at the same time, it is helpful if a parent can have confidence that the experience their child is going to have is pretty much like the experience the child over there is going to have, in terms of quality at least. The RIC plans are interestingly different in their intents. And I will be interested to see how that works out. I, I have some knowledge of the inner workings of some of them, but I'm not at the stage where I'm going to publish anything on this because I'm just learning at the present moment. It looks to me as if some of them are off to a good start and some of them made a much slower start. And that may be due to the local factors and the personnel available to them. Alan has nailed the thing down several times. Local authorities have not ended up necessarily with strong sets of people to do the sorts of developmental and training jobs that we want them to do. And that is a serious problem. And, and it is an issue in terms of councils just slowly being ground down. Uh, I was fortunate to work in the local authority where my director held his budget particularly well. And that meant that we did have development opportunities. But I left seven years ago. Who knows how things are there now? Um, I think it's early days to see fruit coming from the RICs. Uh, there's the whole issue of why did we stuff an extra layer of bureaucracy into the educational system? Um, I was co-author of a report that uh, our head teachers professional association, which shall not be named, wrote the last time this came up. And we recommended that they either went for a regional type system or they kept the councils and strengthened them. And we didn't come down on one side or the other. We, we did not imagine that someone would stuff something in the middle. Um, I think it's going to take them quite a bit of time to maximise the resources that they have to them, and some will be more fortunate in doing that than others. But we're going to have to wait two or three years to see what they produce. Thank you for that. The other question I was going to ask um, relates, I think, to uh, Professor, Professor Scott, the point you made about the 2015 OECD report and its um, suggestion, or more than a suggestion, that there should be a fundamental review uh, of CFE so we know where we are. Um, is there a place, I mean, do other nations, uh, forgive my lack of knowledge of this, do other nations provide, in effect, a state of the nation report on how their education system is doing on a, I don't, probably not on an annual basis, because that strikes me as, on your point about long-term um, assessments, but on a five-year cycle or a three-year cycle? Are there, is there something we should learn from that? Do you want to start, or shall I? Or you yeah, I mean, I... I, I couldn't say whether they do such a thing as a state of the nation report, but where you see systems that implement, you know, fundamental change, uh, I mean, it's quite interesting to look at the example of Wales, for example, which to some extent has followed uh, in the, the, the footsteps of, of Scotland and the, the nature of the educational reforms they've undertaken, um, but with some of the lessons learned, I think, uh, from the, the early implementation phase of Curriculum for Excellence and the rollout, uh, it will be interesting to watch how they do it, because I think they, they were able to, as I say, learn from some of the mistakes, um, start with a much stronger baseline, uh, start with a much stronger sense of what success would look like uh, because that was pretty much absent in the early phase of CFE. Uh, it was you know, very aspirational, but there was very little said at the time about what will success look like. Um, 
So I think it would be interesting to watch how Wales go because they have got that stronger starting point. Uh, and I would imagine they've then got a strong uh, point for review further down the line. Uh, I think this has been a recurring theme in Scottish education uh, for, for quite a long time, going back the uh, Audit Scotland report on the implementation of Macron uh, pointed out that it was almost impossible to evaluate any aspects of effectiveness, value for money, because uh, that was never made clear at the outset. So th there's, no there's nothing new in this, yeah. but nor do we appear to be learning as a system that we have to have a far stronger sense of where we're at just now in order to revisit that further down the line. Yeah, if you have nothing else to do, chapter four of my thesis from 2014 that deals with exactly uh, this point. I'll read it this afternoon. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to waste your time yeah. and go on about it. Um, we, we don't have a good record in Scotland. We, we've probably carried out 22 major educational initiatives since the war, and roughly a third of them worked, a third of them didn't work, and, and the rest were sort of a little bit of it worked. But we tend to abandon things that don't work. And it's true, it's true of all parties. Uh, I can smile at all of you because all of you at various points in time have just given up on things. Uh, and we haven't really learned the lesson about going back to the initiative that we're dealing with and saying, sugar, this isn't working. What can we do about this? How do we make this better? We, set, we tend to say, let's have a new initiative. That'll sort the problem. Modern languages is a classic example of that, I have to say. Um, <laughs> In, indeed. Um, there are some countries that have been reasonably systematic in doing this. In New Zealand, which appears to have a major curricular initiative every 13 or 14 months, not a good idea, it is quite good at publishing stuff. We have been pointed in recent years at Finland because they are quite reflective. Um, I'm not actually sure the Finnish system is remotely transferable to Scotland, but it is interesting to look at. Um, there are really quite different systems in much of Western Europe that don't really coincide with ours particularly well. The, the, the German, Swiss, Austrian, much stronger vocational side tends to make it not a good comparator for us. But it is interesting to read about how they plan that. So there is, there is some meat there that is potentially useful. I have given up trying to read about American curricular developments and probably I should say no more in a parliamentary committee at all. It's not easy to find a simple parallel for Scotland that we can use. I quite like the Welsh one, but I note with interest that they took a whole lot of our people, including Professor Donaldson, mm -hmm. down there to do that. And maybe it was a lesson for us in using our own people more wisely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Hardy. Yeah. I mean, what I'd add to what my colleague said there um, is obviously when the OECD review um, reported that was focused on the broad general education phase because the senior phase was still back in 2014-15 still in its infancy but obviously we've had a number of years of running of the senior phase now and quite quite a lot, a lot of the comments that have come up around the discussion is how the broad general education knits with the senior phase um, given that wasn't covered by the OECD review um, back in 2015 there's potentially a case for um, undertaking a review to systematically look at how the broad general education phase does now fit with the senior phase and to look at, because curriculum for excellence is meant to be um, a free to 18 um, integrated curriculum, but if we've only reviewed up till the, the end of 50, age 15, um, the, 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 the might, it might make sense to look at the system in its totality. Um, and I think the points that Jim just made there about the need for evaluation and building that in from the start of initiatives. OECD clearly said that when they were reviewing um, curriculum for excellence, that the lack of baseline data meant that they weren't able, to, it wasn't possible to undertake a, a, a full and proper evaluation just because the baseline data wasn't there. So, and, and this is a point that the Ross Ross Tate of Edinburgh often makes. Um, and again, it comes back to learning from our mistakes and ensuring that um, data collection, working with independent um, educational researchers, and the need to ensure that evaluation is built in from f to all education reforms so that we can fully evaluate what, what impact they have and how, where improvements can be made. Okay. Uh, Mr Gray. So <clears throat> the committee have heard previously, and a couple of colleagues have referred to this from Education Scotland, <coughs> that there isn't really a problem here, that 
Um, there appears to be a narrowing of choice, but actually what, what that hides is um, a wider choice and access to alternative pathways. So we've heard from the panel uh, today, I think, that in their view that's not the case, that that, that narrowing of traditional subject choice hasn't been replaced by vocational courses, non-SQA courses, uh, and so on. We've also heard from the panel today about a potential reduction in equity, uh, which runs completely contrary to, to the kind of key objective in, in educational policy at the moment. Uh, we've not really heard a, a lot about this, but I think Mr. Allen's going to ask a bit about it. But Mr. Scott has talked about the future of some su subjects in school being in, in jeopardy uh, because of the current trends. Um, and although you don't believe that to be the case around STEM subjects, you do believe um, that there is potential jeopardy towards the economic prospects of the country. And indeed, the RSE have also, I think, expressed concerns about a fall in the number of young people choosing STEM subjects, not just at National 4 and 5, but at higher. Um, and this morning, um, Professor Scott, you said something like there is a danger of a generation losing out. So my question really is, how big a problem have we got here? I mean, how serious are these issues that we're discussing about what is happening in the curriculum, in the senior phase in our schools, uh, and the trends that are there? I mean, Education Scotland told us there wasn't a problem, really, in their evidence. How serious a problem do, do, does the panel think we have? You want me to go first? OK. I, I quite like to hide behind my colleagues for what one. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, it is very difficult to ask a national agency which has a parliament and a government sitting over the top of it if it's not doing a very good job. I've already declined to comment on the leadership of it, and I will continue to decline in that way because people have to be given a chance to do the job. Has it fulfilled the role that certainly, I, you know I had something to do with it at one point in time. I, I worked with it rather than for it. Has it done the job that one would have hoped it would have done in supporting the development of CFE? I don't think so. Certainly not to the extent one would have wished. Is it telling us the truth currently about what is going on well, obviously, one assumes they would believe that is the truth because surely no professional person would turn up here and say other than what they believe to be the truth. So we're really dealing with elements of perception here. And sometimes when you're in a pressured situation and you're leading an initiative and things are falling at you from all places, it's quite difficult to see the wood for the trees. It may be that that is exactly what they believe to be the case, but we're not the only three people in Scotland sitting saying there is a problem here. One hears that from parents. If I walk out of my front door and walk along the road in Dunblane, I bump into people who I know, some of whom are ex-colleagues of mine, some of whom are just people I know. And because I'm an educationalist and I'm occasionally in the papers these days, there is a conversation quite often. They raise issues. My colleagues with whom I work in university and with whom I work in schools, because I still go there quite a lot, raise these issues as well. I've just finished interviewing an entire set of head teachers and deputy head teachers and teachers in one Scottish local authority, and they were significantly clear that the situation is not moving forward in a shiny, polished manner. So I'm forced to say that I don't agree with Education Scotland's analysis and that I believe I have clear evidence, and not just this spreadsheet, but lots of them, that demonstrates that that's the case. I also believe that some of the things you've been told by, I remember an ADES rep, who was it? Terry Lanigan, I think, sat here, and said that there are lots of schools in Scotland doing 666 courses. Well, it was about 31 of them out of 358. So you're being told things that they may believe to be true, because someone told them that but are demonstrably not true when one actually examines the situation. Is that the major problem? Yes, it is. But it means that we have to do what we've all been talking about, <clears throat> which is open this up for sensible debate, 
gather the evidence that needs to be gathered to see what the state of the problem is, and from that build a platform to move forward. It's the only thing we can do. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I could only speak more broadly about the, uh, the situation and the, the danger is that testimony like, like this can be translated into headlines around crisis in Scottish education. Um, so we need to be very careful with that. You know, for example, I don't think there's a crisis in learning and teaching in Scotland's classrooms. The, uh, the, the quality uh, of the teaching profession, I think, has never been higher. Um, and there is some incredible work going on in, in schools at all levels. Um, and I wouldn't say there's a crisis in the system, but I think there are problems with the system, and I've, I've uh, alluded to these uh, earlier on. And I think actually the, the issue of the narrowing of curriculum choice is, is more of a manifestation of wider issues rather than... I mean, it is, a, it is an issue in itself, but it's a manifestation of wider issues. I keep coming back to this that I think we have not yet resolved. I know there was a review of governance, uh, but I think that was pretty inconclusive. Uh, we have to have that open conversation about, uh, about ownership, responsibility, accountability and autonomy in the system. And these are all competing modes of how we do education in Scotland that have been floating around for quite a while and no one has yet resolved them. Do you want to come in? I don't think I've got much to add to what my, my colleague said there. Um, I, I mean, apart from no, no, the need to have a common set of data, um, that we can obviously work from, from the same page and, and where possible having this data independently um, produced as well would be, would be quite helpful. Thank you. I'm going to bring Ms Mackay in. Okay, um, thanks, convener. Um, just sort of following on from that, I just wondered... I uh, wanted to mention outcomes to you in, in terms of, um, you know, notwithstanding everything we've discussed today and the clear issues that there are with equity. I mean, last year there was a record number of pupils went on to university. Um, so, and, you know, positive destinations and apprenticeships, etc. So I'm, I'm wondering how that squares up with the, what we've been discussing and, and all the, you know, the work that's going into to trying to resolve matters. Should the outcomes outweigh all, all of that? I think you're absolutely right to point these out because, in the end, that's what benefits a child in the future. I, I, I always used to try and advise young people to build themselves <clears throat> a range of qualifications and experiences and attributes that would serve them well, not just in the job they thought they were going into straight away or after college or after university, but in the next one and the next one, because that's the society we live in these days. And that requires a balance of things. It doesn't just require that you've got a lot of vocational experience because employers are employers, sadly, and they'll still want to see the set of qualifications on the piece of paper. So we need to build both sides of that. And it's why I brought up, in, in response to Mr Scott's question, it's why I brought up the German, Swiss and Austrian system because they have a far more effective way of balancing the academic and the vocational. I'm not saying I like all parts of it, but it does work. The university improvement is a good thing. There is no doubt about that. Um, that goes with the fact that the level five children are doing better in many cases from CFE. That's one half of the equity issue because they are doing better. There's no doubt about it. And I've given several reasons for why that might be the case and so have my colleagues. At the bottom end, however, it's not like that. I, I take the point about uh, the um, apprenticeships and college entrance was the other thing. Uh, I noticed the Times did a piece on, on my evidence on Saturday and, and the governmental response was exactly that. But the governmental response has shifted. The original governmental response to the first year of data on performance that I put out was about the overall set of qualifications and this was a blip and it would sort itself out. And then it fell back to one needs to look at the totality of the child's education and one needs to look at lever attainment and of course uh, Sadly, I cut the feet out from under the leaf of attainment starts quite effectively fairly recently. And, and now we're talking about something else. And, and that's really my problem of what's going on here because the ground shifts all the time. There's, there's something in here about mission creep. And mission creep actually operates in a number of contexts in CFE. The, the goals of CFE have changed. The ways in which we measure CFE have changed. The, the structures that we put in place to support it and evaluate it have changed. 
And so there isn't actually a, a yardstick that we can lay across it and say, hey, look, things are getting better. It's really quite difficult to do that. And that's why I keep coming back in the end to let's put all the evidence on the table. Because if we put all the evidence on the table, I could, from this, pull out 100 schools from which I have the 5 at 3, 5 at 4, 5 at 5 figures. And they are fascinatingly stark reading. I can't do it because it's not published, and I have to be quite careful how I handle that. Some of them have just gone along as they were before, pretty much. A few of them are actually significantly better in more than one aspect, not just the best, but some others. And some others have absolutely gone down the hill, either at the bottom end or at the top end or both. So there isn't a standard school response to CFE, and that's really the problem that we're all grappling with to some extent, because there are so many variables in the way from the system that was designed. If, if you read the CFE documentation from a curricula for excellence through progress and proposals, BTC3 and so on, none of the structures that we've been grappling with today are actually in these documents at all. They're not there. Time allocations are not there. Numbers of columns in various year groups are not there. Other arrangements, other vocational qualifications, none of it's there. We actually never set out what we wanted to do. We had some cosy and fuzzy ideas that we wanted to make better people who were most successful in four contexts, and that's brilliant. But we didn't then support that with the necessary stuff. We need to put the sort of positive stats you're talking about that show some things are working. I'm amazed no one has come up with tariff points. I was going to raise tariff points and decided I wouldn't bother. Um, because I no, no, nor, nor does any parent. That's why I decided not no. to do it. But one of the, thing, one of the things that quite a lot of Sco Scottish local authorities do to prove that they're doing better is quote the tariff points from Insight. Every course that a child passes gets a number of points depending on the SCQF level it's at. And there are various ways of homologating tariff points. You really didn't want me to start this, did you? <laughs> um, there are various ways of homologating tariff points that allow a, a local authority to see how well it's doing. It flows out of my head just now because I've just analysed the nine SAC authorities and I know quite well that some of them will claim they're doing quite well in tariff points. But I would then set their tariff points against their 5 at 3, 5 at 4, 5 at 5, their lever, lever statistics and demonstrations of other educational experiences children have had. And that is maybe neither to the sorts of things that Jenny was trying to get me to talk about in the first place, to look at the width of Scottish education. If we can get all that data together, we can actually see how well we're doing. Um, I, I bring you back to the last comment, Higios 4, you know, how are we doing, how do we know? The data is there. Any local authority that says it can't tell you it's 5 at 3, 5 at 4, or 5 at 5 figures is not telling the truth. They're an insight. A head teacher should be able to do that and send it straight to headquarters, mm -hmm. and they should have their own version anyway. So we should be able to get that data that allows us to see what the balance between the good points and the bad points is across Scottish schools. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The main point I return to is the one that I made earlier in terms of the research showing that um, the schools in the more disadvantaged areas tend to be the ones who do fewer subjects. But the research also then shows that that um, those choices that they have and, they, and make in S4 then have major implications for what they do in S5, S6 and then beyond school. So with the no, so there's this major equ equity issue there. Um, so if they're somewhat constrained earlier on in the school system and then they can't get that back, then obviously it um, has, has quite major implications for what they do in the senior years of school, but also beyond the school system, so in terms of the, the, the um, destinations after school. So I think the, the main point I would make is just that the equity issue. I mean, that sort of goes back to my earlier point. Should there be a mandate for a minimum? You know, five isn't acceptable. You know, it must be, a, you know, so that that, that might help the, the equity problem. Yeah, I mean, it comes obviously as a complex issue, and no, no one mentioned on the panel about the need for um, obviously meeting the needs of learners themselves. So you don't want to be mandating something which clearly you know, some of them might not be able to attain. So it's, it's obviously trying to get that. Um, balance right, but I think um, constraining to, uh, to a set number of subjects is obviously 
an issue, particularly when there's other schools offering more. Um, so, I mean, I'd be, I'd be keen to look at what the research ter tells us in terms of what do different cur curriculum structures and pathways tell us in terms of attainment for learners and yeah. we're looking at um, no, two-year qualifications rather than just over the year, over one year, just looking at no, different, opening up the pathways a bit more. Just, just the point about mandates again to reiterate that it's the kind of thing that would require legislation, if I understand this, the system correctly, and this, the, the similar scenario relate, related to class size, minimum class mm -hmm. size. That you know that could not actually be implemented as policy mm -hmm. in Scottish education. It required legislation, yeah. um, and so this would be another example where it is conceivable that you could legislate for for a, a minimum number and you could roll in a number of other uh, elements to that. Uh, the question then is, is that how you wish Scottish education to be governed? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Finally, very patiently, Dr Allen. <laughs> thank you very much, um, convener. And uh, as Jenny Gilruth and others have, have referred to this, um, we have been concentrating a lot on fourth year and what happens in fourth year. And the national debate has been uh, concentrating on that when, uh, in fact, it is important what qualifications people leave at the end of uh, the time in school with overall. However, there's no getting away from the fact that in fourth year there are some subjects um, which have gone down particularly. I'm, I'm going to concentrate on languages which have gone down uh, the number of people studying them in fourth year has gone down 18 per cent in four years, but I could equally uh, have picked technology subjects which have also gone down by 18 per cent. I suppose the system is premised on the idea that people will be taking in fifth year these subjects that they're not taking in fourth year. So I suppose probably what many of us in the committee would be looking for is a clear picture of are they, uh, is that happening? I'm tempted to. No, sorry. I'm tempted to quote Sue Moore. Well, Ostig, I can never do that. So your Gaelic's much better than mine. Well, you were right. Um, they, they were very concerned about the concept and their evidence, if I read it correctly, that, that there would be some sort of gap in, in the learning process because we know that in languages, if you do not have that continuous flow of study, it greatly impedes your ability to build up expertise. And the idea that you just will leave it alone for fourth year and come back to it is death to most languages. It's, it's a disgrace to even propose it. Um, obviously, French and German are the, the greatest losers, although Gaelic learners is pretty much in the same ballpark, worryingly. Um, they've dropped 60%, virtually 50 to 60%, depending on the subject, since 2013. That's, that's unbelievable. And that really is quite a serious issue. Um, given that we may all be hurled wool ends, no ends into the more of Brexit, um, we really need people who can go into the world and speak for us. It isn't, it isn't a matter of, that would be a nice idea, it's an essential. And the idea that we've allowed modern languages as another unintended consequence of CFE to just sort of fizzle away, apart from Spanish, uh, those of you who actually have a long history in education will know that in 1947, report from the Advisory Council on Education in Scotland recommended that children of lesser ability, their words not mine, should be made to learn Spanish because it was easy. Uh, and those were the exact words. And I have to say that there is some truth in that because Spanish is holding up. But against that I place the hideously difficult Chinese, which despite the, the tones and all the rest is also holding up. So it, it's not just easiness, it's the factor. The real truth, however, is that if you do six qualifications, Necessarily, you do English and maths. Um, you then do either two socials and a science, or two sciences and a social, or God help us, three sciences. Um, that leaves you one column. And I'm sorry, that's not a curriculum. That might be an English manifestation of a curriculum at the upper stages, but that is not a Scottish curriculum. It isn't even remotely one. Um, and we, we have a real problem there because we've lost the mechanism for breadth in the middle of the, of the, the um, schooling process in secondary. The Scottish Association of Geography Teachers is a bit uh, revisionist in suggesting we go back to 222. But it is it's an interesting thought because that would actually cure quite a lot of these problems. Um, not at the stroke because we'd have to do a lot of work to sort out the mess that's been made. I don't actually know how 
we simply revive the subjects that are dying. My, my, my own personal subject, or one of my two own personal subjects, computing, is in pretty much the same ballpark. I listened with, uh, if I choose my words carefully, abject horror to a representative of Education Scotland in early April, suggesting that if you couldn't get a computing teacher, you should take them all down to a local company that drives drones around the place and they could have a really meaningful experience. Well, hell yeah, it's a really meaningful experience, but it's not an education. Um, I'm quite worried about that because if we start to lose, I, I, was, a, I was a teacher of the information superhighway, you know, it, it, white heat of technology, computing was going to solve all problems. I work in a university where there are several of us like that and where we all are sort of sitting looking at this and thinking, you've got to be joking, we've spent tens of millions of pounds on this, we're allowing our international lead in gaming technology and all sorts of things to just drizzle away. So we have five problems probably. We have a modern languages problem, we have an ICT problem, we have a STEM problem because the, the drop that should have been caused by the structural changes in Scottish education, and I can, t despite key of not getting answers for a lot of them I know, um, I know how many people are doing six columns. Roughly half of Scotland schools are doing six columns. So we, we have a problem there in terms of STEM subjects because STEM subjects suffer, whether you like it or not, in a six column environment. So instead of a 16, 17% drop that we should have had in STEM subjects, we've got about 25 to 27% drop. And then there are problems in the arts and the technologies, as several of us have said this morning, because they're all competing with each other for part of that last space. And it's extremely difficult to give them all the curricular bandwidth unless you hype it up to seven or eight. And I'm not proposing that we go back to eight. I'm not sure how many children ever used their eighth qualification but we need to do something to stop the narrowing from happening. Can I ask if the others want to say anything about it? Yeah, I'm not too sure there's too much I can. Um, Professor Scott um, stole my thunder in terms of the the, the, the reduction in, in, the, in, in particularly in the sciences, but one point that the, the Learning Societies Group had um, highlighted was that whilst, because we focus on 2013 and 2018, because the, the committee call focused on the, the data over the, the, that five-year period. But although the number of um, higher, higher entries across all subjects increased between 2013 and 18, um, the, the, the number of STEM entries proportionally declined relative to, to other subjects. So there might be others, there might have been some other subjects um, clearly um, increasing, but given the, 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 the framework which Professor Scott um, set out there in terms of the narrowing down um, to, to six columns. Clearly, the sciences are, are in some respects, probably competing with one another as well, um, and, uh, and they've certainly suffered both at the um, national qualification level and, and higher level. Just to add that, um, you know, it has it's become a very technical discussion, and I think. The, the technical, technical dimensions to this are very important. But if, if we are reaching a point where there is a, an appetite to review where we've got to, uh, I think it would be important to revisit the, the why questions about what constitutes a uh, curriculum, uh, what are the purposes of education, uh, and if we uh, arrive at the conclusion that education ought to be broad, that it ought to encompass space for people to have uh, artistic, expressive arts experiences alongside science and English and maths, then as a system we have to uh, invest in that. Uh, you know, the, uh, the evidence that the, uh, the committee's own re uh, review has, has shown here is the, the message from teachers is actually that, well, you know, there are all kinds of barriers, but actually the bottom line is you know, availability of teachers' resources at the most local level. Uh, that was what was coming across from them. Uh, so I think we have to review, OK, because this, and this was the starting point. I, I made this point last time that the, uh, the national debate in 2002 was in many respects less interesting than your predecessor committee's report on the purposes of the curriculum. And I, actually, I think that's the thing that we might choose to, to hook any review on is what is the purpose of curriculum? Because to some extent, 
we started with that, but then it's been diluted and has become a very technical response, school by school, local authority by local authority, whereas in fact it might be time to look back at right, why are we educating, why do we value certain subjects more than others, uh, and then follow the conclusions that might arise from that. It, it, sorry, can I sneak in a tiny other bit that I should have said? Um, whoever said that a three-year BGE was a good idea? Where did that come from? I think I know the answer, but again, I, I cannot say in a public forum. Because if I read the documentation that quite a few people around this room either had something to do with or signed or whatever, um, realistically speaking, at no point in time do we justify the three-year BGE. And I'm sure it was somebody's good idea, but it was never carried through in a process of consultation of analysis in any way. The unwise timetabling decisions that followed from the three-year BGE led to the six course and five course, God help us, difficulties. And all of it comes back to that. Before we launched CFE, HMI was telling us that we wasted the first two years anyway. They said we didn't do it well, we weren't focused, we weren't organised, so we blew it up by 50% and made it a three-year period like that. That caused the compression at the back end, and that caused the very subject difficulties that we're talking about. If we're going to review it, is that not the starting point? OK. Thank you um, very much for your attendance and your submissions to the committee. They've been very, very helpful. Um, I'm going to suspend for five minutes to 11.51 uh, and I remind members that we will be coming back into public session. Thank you.
Thank you. The second item of business is consideration of responses to the Music, Tuition and Schools report. Responses have been received from the Scottish Government and COSLA and in paper four of today's committee papers. Members will be aware that the committee is holding a debate on the report of the Chamber next Tuesday afternoon, which will be a further opportunity to discuss these re responses. Are there any comments on the responses from Scottish Government and COSLA? Is everybody content to have the debate next week and um, look at the report then? That's that's great. Thank you very much. Agenda item three is subordinate legislation. It's consideration of teachers superannuation and pension scheme Scotland miscellaneous amendments amendment regulations 2019 SSI 2019 -19. Stroke 95. This is a negative instrument which amends another negative instrument considered by the committee before Easter recess. Do the members have any comments on this instrument? Nope. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, that concludes the public session for this week. The next session of our inquiry will be on the 1st of May and I'll now suspend as we move into private session. <laughs>